Hello, everybody. I'm Levi Litpe from Central European University, and I'm here to talk to Matthias Rodan uh, from uh, the University of Amsterdam. And we are here to talk about his 2019 article in the European Journal of Political Research. Congratulations, by the way. Awesome hit. Uh, uh, the article is titled State of the Field, How to Study Populism and Adjacent Topics, a plea for both more and less focus. Uh, it's a great review article, and we are very blessed to have you speak with us. So welcome. Thanks. Great to be here. So, um, so, so why did you write this piece? It, it's it's clearly a review article, and it's great that they they published it. Where, where did this idea come from? Um, it well, I, I think. I think Brexit and uh, uh, the vote for Donald Trump really, uh, and, and, and the results of, uh, well, one of the consequences of this success of populists was that the, uh, the concept of populism had become extremely sexy, as I, uh, I think that's the first sentence of the piece as well. Um, yes. it, it, was, <laughs> it was extremely fashionable. And um, I was worried about that because, um, what I saw was that at once everything was populism. Uh, so um, I was really, before I was really happy that in the field, as you know, um, um, there, is, there was increasing agreement on what populism is, right? Uh, we have this ideational definition and many people um, actually employ this de definition in their work and, and this really, um, increased uh, uh, in the, this really increased communication. It really made it possible to build on each other's work because we use the same definition of populism. But now with Trump and with uh, Nigel Farage, we had this uh, explosion of of of, uh, of a focus on populism. Of, of, of and, and the concept became so fashionable that in uh, research articles and in grant proposals, but also in the media. Um, people use the word populism because it was so hot. And um, a consequence is, of course, then, that the concept again becomes more well, blurry. It, it, it is less clear what it actually is if, is everybody, is, if, if everybody's going to use it without really defining it. So I was uh, not really happy with this, uh, uh, with this consequence of the success of populist parties. Of course, I was also uh, I was also happy because it's my work and I I, I love populism, <laughs> <laughs> but this was one of the things I disliked about it. <laughs> one of the things yeah, well, I disliked. I I feel like this has been a curse in populism research from day one that uh, that there's such a diverse set of characters uh, going from Latin America to to Western Europe, uh, leftists, right wingers that that populism was a mess to begin with, <laughs> and yeah. and um, but you're right I I, I kind of joined this research agenda around 2013 so that would be like what eight years ago now. Uh, a little before this uh, this explosion due to Trump uh, and and Brexit, and um, and I was very much bothered by by both the lack of clarity, uh, but also the, the just the quality of 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 the empirics as well. I mean, there wasn't that much systematic conceptualization. There wasn't that much systematic measurement. There wasn't that much comparative research. Uh, you go to a populism conference and you have to listen to single country case studies uh, based on normative complaints about what the, uh, what the resident leader or, or resident uh, uh, party that, uh, that uh, mutually dislikes us elites and, uh, <laughs> and, and um, yeah, so the, we had we had this, uh, this, 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 this kind of mess anyway. But this has started to go away with the ideational definition. So that was that was nice, and people were starting to measure populism, as you very much mentioned in in the paper, as like the development of the of the fifteen years. Um, kind of what got me interested is there was a shift to study people, 
how people understand popular, the public, the general public, kind of the, the what we call the demand side, which is also something you, you list. Uh, that, that's what got me interested in the field. Uh, and this was all going on before uh, Brexit and Trump. And then uh, Brexit and Trump happened and populism, what, became the, the, the word of the year, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it really felt like, okay, so you have children, right? So mm -hmm. often they're playing and there's one big mess in, in the room. At a certain point, you want to, 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 to start... Uh, <laughs> start uh, well, uh, cleaning the room, etc. And so it felt like you were cleaning it. It was, it was, it was okay again. But then, bam! They they drop like everything, and uh, there are toys all over the place. That is how it felt like when Trump, well, after the Trump victory and the Brexit uh, uh, vote, because we were there. We had this 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 these good definitions. We had the the measurements, and now everything <laughs> would uh, go wrong again. That was my impression. I don't think it's 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 not that dramatic uh, uh, now. Uh, like we're five years, four years after the Trump victory, a, a bit more uh, after the Brexit. Um, maybe, so maybe maybe you don't talk to Bernie Sanders supporters that much because I do, <laughs> and, and if you talk to them, it's still a mess because they don't think Trump and Bernie Sanders have anything to do with each other. <laughs> and yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah. Um, so it's it's it. But it, it felt like that, and I thought I, I need to write something about that. And it's good. I think that for myself it was good to to order my thoughts, but also for uh, uh, scholars to to write down where we were uh, 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 in 2019 when it came to populism studies. Uh, what were the problems? What were the things? Uh, the good things? What were the things that were more challenging? Yeah. So, um, so okay, we, we, we talk about some developments in the field in the past 15 years. You mentioned that, uh, that people have started to, uh, um, started to, uh, well, there was the agreement on the definition there, there's, uh, more systematic measures that are comparative that we can apply. Uh, there was a, a shift from the supply side just studying the leaders to studying the demand side just studying the public and public opinion um and uh, and uh, th there was some delineation of how how this research is different from uh well studying nativism and nationalism first of all uh but also political cynicism efficacy so so that that was uh, that was one of the things you mentioned uh, there is an increased contribution from uh, from uh, communication scholars and trying to understand populist communication and the impacts of populist communication. Experiments started to pop up. So this is what I what, what I found exciting about this this research yeah. is when 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 all of this started happening uh, and uh, and uh, life has allowed us to study populists in power. So I mean Hungary was where I'm from is, 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 is a very prominent case of, of a populist government gaining power in 2010 and, uh, and Poland followed shortly after. And then, and then, you know, now we have Boris Johnson and Donald Trump as well, uh, as well. There's some other cases too. Syriza is, is one that comes to mind, uh, left populist in Europe and Greece. So, um, so yeah, so we started to study the consequences of populist in power, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, anything you want to highlight from this or, or should we move to the challenges that this posed? <laughs> no, I think so. So these are the, the you, I think you mentioned them all, the most important developments. And I think also still very uh, big questions out there. So many questions still out there about the uh, so until not so long ago populism was something that existed only among political parties and politicians so parties and politicians were populist or not uh, and maybe more or less populist um, but not citizens so much and this is you, you said this is what what really uh, made you interested in the topic 
And this also, I think this is a very important uh, move forward. So the idea that it's not just parties and politicians that are more or less populist, but also citizens can endorse this set of ideas to a, um, a lesser or larger extent. And I think that's a very important, um, uh, that's a very important development. At the same time, I think it's also very important, and, and, and this also this is what we will talk about later as well. Um, it's really important to link this new uh, um, booming uh, part of populism studies to existing work. So we still we already know a lot about political attitudes, when it, uh, right? So uh, like yeah. uh, political trust, cynicism, uh, stealth democracy, uh, polit external political uh, efficacy, internal political efficacy. Populist attitudes are related to uh, these types of attitudes. And uh, Andrei Zaslov and many others have studied this, you too. Um, and I think we still there is still a lot of work to be done um, when it comes to the question, how exactly does it relate to these uh, other types of attitudes? And I think that's a very interesting move forward. And, and the other one is what you mentioned, um, the focus on populism and power. This is, of course, not something new. Um, we already, right, so we had um, uh, in, in, in the 2000s, it started in Europe, basically, uh, that, 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 that far-right populist, like uh, the, the FPÖ in Austria, Enter the government coalition. We had a, a, a not far right wing populist in Italy in 1994. Those were the, 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 the some of the cases, but we also had Greece, of course. Um, in Latin America, um, the history of populism power, of course, goes further back. However, with all the new cases in Europe, we have much more. We have we have so many more cases that we can study to 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 see how populism is related to power, how populism is related to democracy, uh, to what extent it forms a threat or a, a corrective, to use uh, uh, a famous uh, Kistobal's famous words uh, to democracy. So I think these are very uh, important uh, uh, topics to study. And the other one, by the way, I think the, the third one is very important as well. Is uh, 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 political communication. So uh, to what extent do, what are the effects of populist messages? Uh, communication scholars, but also political scientists, sociologists, psychologists have done experiments to see how um, uh, populist messages affect attitudes, behavior, etc. And I think that's also a very important step forward. So going back to the point on populist in power uh, and the consequences, I, I almost feel like uh, being in power is overstated. So, so just the emergence of populism in the party system and their presence on the political scene uh, can have very, very drastic impact. Now you mentioned Cristobal, uh, this is Cristobal Rovira Kalkbuster, who, who mentioned that his main research agenda is just to understand what happens when populists become part of the, the 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 system? And of course, it leads to higher polarization. These are these are some of the hypotheses that are starting to get some support, <laughs> empirical support now. So I don't even think that populists need to be in power to study like strong consequences of of populists. Yeah. Populists just need to be an option or part of the party system or part of the the, the political uh, um, spectrum in a place and that can have very very uh, drastic impacts just their presence so yeah. Uh, so so yeah in a way I, I, I think uh, more populist being in power is, is 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 almost I feel like it's a little bit overstated and of course, we don't have very, very good tools uh, to, to study these things. So, so here comes a plug for one of your projects. So you have the populist data set, which, uh, which gathers Europe's, and you're expanding, right? You're expanding beyond Europe now. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, not yet. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so like Europe's party systems and, and like defines uh, uh, the party systems in terms of who's populist and who's not populist. So that that is exactly what we need and what we need more of. And you mentioned Andrei Zaslov with uh, his colleague who's 
whose name is very Dutch, so you should know it, and I won't. Uh, uh, Agnes Ackerman, Christoph Jacobs. No, the the I'm I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the uh, expert survey. Uh, uh, the expert survey. Ah, uh, um, There's an no. M in the name. He's uh, same department, I believe. Oh, Maurits, you mean? Maurits, yeah, Maurits. yeah, yeah, yeah. their experts. <laughs> sorry, I was thinking uh, uh, yeah, of, yeah, of a different yeah, no, expert no. service. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, no, sorry, no, no, sorry. no, no, no. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, They've so, done this so, pop uh, expert survey, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. They're, they're starting to map which parties are popular. Yeah. So. So these projects are, are invaluable. I'm, I'm hoping that we can do like more, more content analysis, like manifestos yeah. and just to be able to get entire party systems um, mapped. Yeah. So we, so we know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I fully agree. So I think the, the this, um, so I, 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 I emphasize this, uh, uh, this new focus on power because that was relatively new, but as, but I also fully agree that I think um, in order to understand the changes that are still taking place in, in, in European, but also beyond Europe, uh, party systems, um, it's not just populist in power that that, that, that that makes a difference. I mean, just entering the scene makes a very big difference. And I think um, um, mapping what is going on is very important. And I think with the populist, we make an, a, a good contribution. But I also think Maurits and Andres uh, expert survey is very important because it 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 shows how or it, it shows how populist parties are and and of course with the populist we classify parties as either populist or not populist and they uh, um, turn populism into a matter of degree you can be more or less populist and I think both approaches are useful right so sometimes you just want to know if a party can be seen as a populist party, do they emphasize, it's one of the core issues, this um, uh, distinction between the evil elite and the good people. But sometimes you want a more nuanced approach. You want to, uh, um, you want to uh, uh, know whether a party, for instance, has changed over the years. Has a party become more or less populist? Uh, a good example is Fidesz, for instance, right? This party has really changed over the years into from not populist to populist, from not far right to far right. Um, from left to right. If you, yeah. From left to right, yeah. <laughs> if you go all the way, if you go all yeah. the way back to if the early yeah. 90s, yeah. Yeah, so I think that there, if you if, if, if you uh, uh, really want to, to look at small changes over time, or maybe also differences between parties, there this matter of degree approach that, that, that that's in this expert survey, survey is really important. Um, but in general, I, 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 I think that in order to understand the changes that these parties have made to their party systems, it's not just, just populists being in power. In fact, I think, okay, I, this is just an hypothesis, not, not <laughs> just, a, just an idea. I think that the, the effect of populists entering the scene has been more important than the effect of populists entering a government, with some exceptions. And Hungary maybe is an exception. Um, but here, of course, the thing is also that it's just one party, right? One leader that that exerts this impact. Um, and this is different when a populist party enters uh, a government co a coalition uh, uh, or a, a, a case in which um, the party is less authoritarian uh, than in this case. No, I think you're right, but I mean, we, we have to look at these questions with respect to the dependent variable. Like, uh, yeah. you know, it's more important with regards to what. <laughs> so, yeah. so yes, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, changing the political landscape, yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, yeah. In terms of uh, shifting attitudes, uh, polarization, uh, yeah, probably. So, but that's actually one of the questions that I would be very much interested in as, as somebody who is interested in public opinion is, is how do these macro level phenomenon like entering the system, entering government, uh, becoming the head of the government, uh, how yeah. are these things influencing? But, but I mean, this is very difficult because we need very good quality data. We need a lot of cases. And those are the two yeah. things that we 
do not necessarily have yet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and I think overlapping. yeah, 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 and I think I, I think what is really um, what is really even so the one thing that 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 one could think of that is important that is affected more strongly by populists going into power is policy. But even there, one could imagine that um, uh, we know that populist parties, because of their populism, maybe more so because of their main ideology, they also affect other parties and these other parties yes. then make new policies, right? So they also have an indirect effect. My colleague yes. Chitska Ackerman has written a, a paper. It's, it's not about their populism, it's about their anti-immigration attitudes. But she shows, and that's very interesting, that in many cases, it's not the direct effect on policy or, or let's frame it differently far right-wing populists do not exert a direct effect on policy but an, an indirect effect because they influence mainstream parties and these mainstream parties then change policies and therefore they do exert a big effect on policy as well not just on uh on on on, on, on cleavages or uh the way in which campaigns are uh, uh, done or uh, 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 many different all these kinds of variables, but even on policy making, but there the effect is indirect. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the challenges you lay out. So uh, so you say that uh, it's easy to confuse populism with related concepts. I mean, th this has been an age old problem in in this research and probably one of my pet peeves, except uh, you write about it. I don't. I just complain. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, so what do you mean? Yeah, so. It's basically that, um, and this is what I said, right? So we have the, um, uh, in the beginning, we have the, 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 the Trump victory, the Brexit vote. And one of the consequences is that in the public debate, but also in academia to a lesser extent, but still um, there is this idea that populists are always nativists, that they're also always exclusionistic, uh, nationalistic, et cetera. And I think this is very problematic. It's very important to be very precise when we use our concepts. And I think nativism or uh, exclusionism, xenophobia are, are all related. It's very different from populism. And I think it's really important that we make this distinction. Um, far right. So I think in Europe, the main problem is, is, is this. The most successful populist parties have been radical right-wing populist parties. So they combine their populism with this uh, nativist message that 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 there is this uh, group of immigrants or people uh, of another religion uh, that does not fit into our national identity. They combine this message with the populist message that there is an evil elite uh, that doesn't listen to ordinary citizens. They they combine these two messages. That is what these radical right-wing populists do. These parties are by far in Europe the most successful populist parties. So in Europe, there is this idea that these two things, this nativism and this populism, always that they always coincide, that it's always together. But that's simply not true. They're two different things. And in order to understand populist parties and to understand far-right parties, but also to understand populist radical left parties, it's very important that we that we disentangle this 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 patchwork yeah, would, of concepts. Yeah, I would say that it's even more important when we try to understand the consequences of populism. That we, yeah, we need yeah. to understand that that is what happened. Is this anti-immigration policy? Are these anti-immigration policies uh, the impact of populism? or nationalism because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a big difference and you say that it in research it's not that prominent well uh maybe not maybe populism researchers are starting to agree on this kind of uh, clear ideational definition which manages to strip out populism from 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 ideology but uh if you look at the comparative study of election systems if i can uh, i it's great that they've included populism items in uh, yeah. in such a big public opinion survey. But under the populism heading, they have nativist questions as well. 
so yeah. uh, so that's uh, potentially problematic. So yeah. and it's problematic not just in the general discourse, but also in research. In the, well. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can sort it out, but uh, but um, yeah. So no, so but it's very important going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I th at the same time, it's also important. So I think it's very important that you uh, that you keep that in mind that there are different things and that parties can combine the two. Often, success that they successfully combine the two because uh, uh, they go together really well. But that we have many uh, populist parties that are not nativists that do not use such a language. And um, but at the same time, it's important uh, uh, to emphasize as well that. Um, both also are part of the same family of in-group, out-group attitudes, yes. right? So nativism and populism both emphasize that there is an in-group that is good and that there is an out-group that is bad. Um, but the way in which the in-group and the out-group are defined are really, really different. So we should acknowledge that Populism and nativism do have something in common, but we should also acknowledge that they are really, really different. Yeah. So one of the things you mention here is, is we should study, I mean, we should understand the research adjacent to populism and, and, and interact with it. So instead of conflating the populism concept, we should tease it out and say, this is populism, this is, this is nativism, this is, uh, well, one of the things you mentioned is uh, anti-establishment parties um, as well. So I can think of good examples of, of radical right parties that are not populist. Um, you know, the Golden Dawn is probably the most, uh, most commonly used examples. I would say that Fidesz's Jopik is not at all populist. <laughs> I think uh, for a while they'd be, they would have been happy with the king. So I mean, <laughs> power to the people, no, no way. <laughs> we need to keep the people away and have a, have a, have a, have a king. Uh, I'm exaggerating, I think, but, but they're not, I mean, there, there is no populist uh, message there for sure. If we stick to the ideational definition, uh, you mentioned the anti-establishment parties. What did, did what did you have in mind? Because uh, I, I I was struggling with that one personally when I was reading your article. Yeah. Did you have anything in mind? Anything specific? You you mean specific parties? Yeah. Or, yeah. So this there is this this literature about an, anti-establishment parties, and I think. What is really interesting is that this literature is, uh, or no, let me see, the, the definition of anti-establishment parties comes very, very close to the definition of populism. Um, they both emphasize that the anti-establishment char uh, character of, 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 of pop populists or anti-establishment politicians. And they also emphasize the distinction with ordinary citizens. Um, However, I think that the main difference would be that populism more strongly focuses on this, this people centrism and, and that uh, anti-establishment parties, right? That the, the focus is more on the anti-establishment uh, feature. Um, but what is interesting that they are really close to each other. They have a lot in common. Um, so this means two things. First, um, we need to carefully look at the parties that are actually investigated by studies focusing on anti-establishment parties. And if you look at them, you will see that many of these parties are not necessarily populist because they are, for instance, communist parties or the, the parties you just okay. mentioned, right? The Golden Dawn is a far right wing party, but it's not populist. So they are all anti-establishment parties, uh, but not populist parties. So when drawing conclusions, we should look carefully at the parties that are actually investigated. Uh, and, and, and these are, many parties that are not populist. Um, however, the ideas uh, uh, formulated in this literature, the hypotheses that are tested in this literature are very informative for populism studies. So I think that yeah. uh, because the, the definitions are so alike that we can learn a lot. And this, um, I, in, in this article, I use uh, this piece by um, Joost van Spanje. Um, and it's very interesting uh, it's, it's a very interesting study with some interesting hypotheses and interesting findings. 
But the communication between this literature and the populism literature is almost non-existent. And this is very, not, not completely uh, non-existent, but it's, it, there, there is not a lot of communication between the two. And this is, uh, I think, problematic. And, and, and it's true for this anti-establishment concept, but it's also true for other related concepts like prejudice or what I just mentioned, in-group, in out-group thinking. thinking. Uh, effective polarization is also one of the concepts that, 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 that comes really close to populism, but is also very different, but can also uh, um, help populism scholars to come up with new interesting uh, uh, frameworks with new uh, interesting questions, hypotheses, etc. So I think that um, uh, although we should be very careful and we cannot just translate directly uh, uh, these concepts or these questions, but that we can still learn a lot from it and that we can uh, uh, come up with new interesting um, uh, with new interesting studies based on these uh, uh, these other literatures yeah so um so in, in conclusion you say that well i mean the article's title says that uh, that you want both more and less focus um how, how, so how is this not contradictory just to, to yeah up? that was the challenge to try to <laughs> bring that message across <laughs> yeah um so uh, yeah, so I think that is also a, to some extent what I what I was uh, uh, saying just now. I think that we need to be very very careful when we design our studies. That we need to be very precise and consistent when we uh, define our concepts. When we categorize the parties we we, we focus on, right? When, when in, in the case we focus on parties, that we should be very. Uh, 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 precise also when we draw conclusions based on the analysis of specific parties, that we should be very precise and we should be very careful in, 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 in the conclusions we draw, in the, the, the inferences we make. But um, this is where we should be very focused, right? So this is the focus part. However, when we uh, uh, are uh, exploring the literature, uh, if we uh, look for new uh, innovative ideas, uh, if we look for uh, um, questions, if we look for uh, uh, answers to things we're struggling with, we should not just type populism in our Google uh, 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 page, right? We should also look for other literatures because there's a lot out there and many things uh, I I'm not even aware of. Uh, there are so many studies focusing on related but different topics, and we can learn a lot from these studies. Um, uh, just recently, I read a paper about generalized prejudice, so prejudice towards different types of groups. Um, this is completely not connected to the populism literature, but they do have a lot in common, right? This, this, uh, part of populism that is and uh, populism is by definition anti anti elitist generalized prejudice focuses on many different kinds of prejudice uh, one of them being anti elitism um, but the communication between these types of study is 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 just not there and I think um, I think scholars in the field of populism but also scholars in different fields should communicate more and should learn more from each other because there is a lot out there to discover. Yeah. And there, so yes, so, the, so, so. Yeah, one of the fields that comes to my mind is, is the, the research on technocracy, which yeah. is like almost an antithesis of, of populism. Yeah, and, or not. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't think this research, yeah, communicates so much, so. Yeah. Yeah, Karamani, of course, has uh, done some interesting uh, work on this uh, uh, topic. But 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 you're you're right. Yeah, there is not uh, stealth democracy, right? We've mm -hmm. talked about that. Yeah, that's also about it. very closely related to uh, to populism differences, of course, but also very related. So my message here is: you should be very focused when it comes to the specific categorizations and definitions you use, the inferences you draw. But you should be not that focused. You should be open, uh, more, much more explorative when it comes to uh, um, uh, looking for new 
uh, points of view, looking for new studies, uh, looking for new questions. There you should be much more, people should be much more open and much more uh, open, um, uh, basically have a wider framework, in, include much more than just those studies that have populism or populist in their titles. Yeah. I, I'm wondering, let me ask you this, because because uh, you obviously we come across this a lot. Why do people conflate populism with whatever they're studying? Uh, like when you get articles to review, don't you get a million articles that are not about populism, but it's like populist, 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 populist yeah, yeah. all over the place? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the that's the problem of the the the, the, the sexiness of the term, right? <laughs> right yeah. now. Yeah. It sells, and academics, unfortunately, also want to sell their product. <laughs> yeah, but does it sell? Because then they're going to send the article. Yeah. I mean, the editors are going to send the articles to reviewers like you and me, or like, this yeah. is not about populism. It's a great article uh, about uh, the AfD. Please send it to yeah. some German-specific. <laughs> and yeah. strip out all the populism, please. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or just... <laughs> replace the word populism <laughs> with nativism <laughs> yeah and exactly. then you're fine <laughs> yeah or you your skepticism find... or whatever yeah i've said this in a review that please do a find and replace and wherever yeah. you say populist radical right just take out populist and say radical right <laughs> so yeah I, i've yeah, yeah. said this in reviews before so uh, yeah i might yeah, be revealing think... myself now to people but... <laughs> <laughs> and you were that <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I mean, this is something that, uh, but it's also difficult. I mean, I have also done this and I have always emphasized that this is so important. So um, I think that what we, what we talked about in the beginning is very important. I think where you come from is uh, um, also affecting, um, is also affecting how you use these concepts. So because I am from Western Europe, I'm probably much more likely to conflate populism and nativism than someone who is from Latin America, right? Because most populists yeah. there are, well, we now have uh, Bolsonaro, but, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> until recently, most Latin American influential populists were left-wing populists. So they would not very easily conflate nativism with populism. So it also depends on, on where you come from. And the fact that, um, um, again, most Western European populists are radical right-wing populists um, leads, well, well, makes that people who do not know the literature on populism very well, conflate the two concepts. Yeah. And it, it does make, yeah. yeah. It's not good, but it, yeah. yeah. It's not well, strange I'm either. Therefore, you publish great articles like this one in great places. And I think that's, that's a good way to close this conversation. Hopefully, people read the European Journal of Political Research. It's only probably the most prestigious European journal. So uh, so uh, congratulations for this, uh, for this article. And uh, writing about all the things I only just complain about, because I do that often. <laughs> so, so, and thank you very much for, for joining and talking, talking about this article. Thank you for inviting me. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.